guns, knives, poison, bombs. Time and again, assassins have sought to change the course of history through one single, terrible act. I'm Neil Cooper, the host of Assassinations Podcast. Join me each week as I explore the darker side of history. New episodes are released every Monday and are available on iTunes and our website, assassinationspodcast.com. In 368 BCE, a 14-year-old Macedonian prince by the name of Philip advanced his way up to the Acropolis of Cadmia, the citadel of the city of Thebes in central Greece, anticipation building as he ascended at each step, not to marvel at the surrounding city that was abuzz with its newfound status as the hegemon or dominant power in Greece, but to observe the training of its elite infantry the famed and feared Sacred Band of Thebes, a vital aspect in propelling the recent Theban ascendancy, who had played a headlining role in the surprising Theban victory over the Spartans just a few years prior in the Battle of Leuctra. Philip, along with everyone in classical Greece, had been astonished to hear of these events, the seemingly invincible Spartans, cast down by the invigorated Thebans led by the Sacred Band, Philip was new to Thebes. Although technically a hostage in the city, he had been afforded a great deal of freedom and was encouraged to follow his interests, showing considerable enthusiasm for military education, and he was determined to assess this group for himself, through his very own eyes, to see if they were worthy of the praise that had been poured upon them. As soon as he reached their training grounds, Philip, having watched only for a few minutes, began to realize that he was indeed witnessing something special. An elite force unparalleled versus anything he had previously come across, especially back home in Macedonia that habitually neglected this aspect of its army. The sacred band of Thebes consisted of 300 men, men of exceptional athleticism, ability and bravery, who were handpicked for this unit solely based on merit and skill, regardless of social class. Their year-round training regiment, intense and relentless, bestowed this group with an almost supernatural sense of discipline and precision, clearly on display when drilling as a cohesive body in various formations. Formidable indeed, with their shields locked in unison, all emblazoned with the club of Heracles the greatest of mythological Greek heroes. Immediately, Philip began to appreciate just how devastating such a force could be in battle, particularly when deployed for a specific tactical purpose, intended to shock and dismay the best units of adversarial armies. If 300 could be the difference in a battle of thousands, imagine what a larger force of elite infantry could do with shields instead emblazoned with the Argeid star, the royal symbol of the kingdom of Macedon. Philip would go back to the site and watch them often, each time picking out a nuance of their formations or perhaps an aspect of their training. Learning, absorbing, filling his young mind with possibilities for his homeland, which he realized was considered by most as nothing more than a periphery player on the fringes of the Greek world stage. However, as the sacred band had demonstrated, sometimes it only takes few in number, given the right preparations and right applications, to reach magnificent heights that no one would have ever thought possible. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Episode 13 and the second, delving into the lifetime, motivations, and events surrounding Philip II of Macedon. Before jumping straightway into this episode, you may first want to give episode 12 a listen, wherein we burrow back in time to frame up the tumultuous history of the kingdom of Macedon, 
from its founding in 808 BCE leading up to Philip's youth. But here's a quick little summary to help bring you up to speed or act as a refresher in terms of where we last ended up. In episode 12, we began with the origins of the ancient kingdom of Macedon, placing it in modern central North Greece and the southern reaches of the Republic of North Macedonia. Founded in 808 BCE by Philip's ancestors, those of the Argea dynasty, a dynastic lineage that was connected to the mighty mythological characters of the Greek pantheon, Heracles and his thunderbolt-throwing father Zeus, the king of the gods, but most importantly, establishing the Argea divine right and theirs alone to rule these lands as kings, a title also known in Greek as Vasileus a fledgling kingdom that was initially located in the fruitful flatland plains between the Haliacomon and Axios rivers in modern northern Greece, forming what would later be called Lower Macedonia. This was the area from which the kingdom gradually expanded during the 5th century BCE, into the surrounding tribal highlands commonly referred to as Upper Macedonia, forming two distinct parts of what was supposed to be one kingdom, with Upper Macedonia consisting of various tribes with their own royal families, actively pursuing their own economic and political interests and goals, regardless of whether or not these conflicted with the objectives of the reigning Argeid monarch. As such, disunity and internal conflict became an ongoing and defining feature of the kingdom, a divide that left them all vulnerable to the incursions of the non-Greek tribal nations that surrounded Macedonia towards the west, north, and east of their domains, including the Illyrians, Dardanians, Paeonians, and Thracians. Alluding to another prevalent theme that was raised, in that, although the Macedonians shared a common heritage with the rest of Greece that resided beyond their southern border marked by Mount Olympus, distance was created in this regard as the Macedonians throughout their history inevitably mixed their bloodlines with the neighboring non-Greek peoples. And so, despite the commonalities, much of the Greek world at the time saw them not really as Greeks and little more than barbarians, and certainly not much more than a pawn or fringe player in the politics and designs of greater nations, such as the Achaemenid Persians, followed by the successive hegemons of Greece, Athens, Sparta, and then Thebes. To make matters even worse, this happening all the while an invasive and diseased culture attached itself to the Macedonian court, infighting, intrigue, deceit, and murder among the royalty and nobility, further destabilizing the king's position and authority, severely constraining the ability of whoever sat in the throne to build any forward momentum anchoring the kingdom of Macedon into its perpetual status as a second-rate power, deeply factionalized with a poor economy and mediocre military power, barely able to stay afloat, and desperately fending off the assaults from surrounding nations. Very real and ongoing attempts that threaten to topple the kingdom, a notion especially prevalent during transitions of power, such as when Philip's eldest brother, Alexander II, assumed the Macedonian throne in 370 BCE. When we last left things off, it was 368 BCE, and the 14-year-old Philip, along with 49 others, the future holders of power among the Macedonian nobility, made their way to the city of Thebes to be held as hostages, as a result of the actions of King Alexander II of Macedon, who had just sparked the anger of the newly minted hegemon of Greece, after having betrayed Macedon's northern Thessalian allies by deceitfully occupying a number of their cities, most notably Larissa, under the guise of providing military assistance against their foes from southern Thessaly. The audacious Macedonian attempt to conquer its southern Greek neighbors evoked a harsh response from the militaristic Thebans, who quickly gathered an army and went on to easily rout the invaders, hardly breaking a sweat and pushing them back to Macedonia. So utterly and convincing were they beaten that Alexander immediately made desperate overtures for peace. While we don't have details on the terms of the agreement, one condition that we do know of 
was a demand for 50 young Macedonian nobles that were to be sent to Thebes as hostages, thereby helping to ensure Macedon's good behavior and adherence with Theban interests, including not impinging on its allies. Otherwise, forfeit the lives of a considerable number of people that would play a leading role in the future of the Macedonian kingdom. Which of course sounds rather ominous. However, this was probably the best thing that could have happened to Philip for a number of reasons. The first one being removing him from the copious intrigue and infighting that would continue to infest and degrade the Macedonian court, which we'll expand upon shortly. In addition to that, the Thebans didn't reportedly mistreat the hostages, but rather housed them with prominent families and members of Theban society, furthering their education and, all in all, treated them quite well, which I believe to have been more of a political calculation, perhaps in the effort to win their loyalty and adherence to Theban supremacy, a notion designed to yield further benefits down the road once they return to their homeland. Philip, in particular, was a huge beneficiary of this, and I'm convinced that his time in Thebes played a profound role in molding him into the leader he became, especially in terms of military tradition, strategy, tactics, and innovations. Because during his time in Thebes, he would be exposed to some of the best military minds of that generation, learning foundational lessons that he would later build upon, and apply to the Macedonian military machine that would later come to dominate the Balkans, Greece, and ultimately the Achaemenid Persian Empire under his son Alexander. This must have been an exciting time to be in the city of Thebes, buzzing with confidence and wealth at the apex of their ascendancy as the most powerful state in the Greek world, at the height of their prestige and influence. The political structure of Thebes was an oligarchy, with power residing in the hands of a small group of military leaders. And at this time, it was a particularly talented generation of key figures that arose to leadership in Thebes at roughly the same time, ushering in the Theban hegemony. Although, as a quick side note, there was a double-edged sword to this, as the Golden Age of Thebes lived and died by this group with Theban supremacy eroding away upon their eventual passing. When he arrived in Thebes, Philip was placed under the care of Paminas, who housed the Macedonian prince and continued his education. Paminas, who was an influential and wealthy aristocrat, was also a general of some repute, part of the collection or generation of generals that had played a fundamental role in driving Theban dominance. More important than his credentials, however, at least to Philip that is, was his social circle that included a wide assortment of impressive people, certainly none more so than Epaminondas, who was highly regarded as the best general of his generation, and arguably in all of Greece at that time, a status and fame that was galvanized when he led the outnumbered Theban forces to victory over Sparta in the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BCE. Paminas and Epaminondas were close friends, affording Philip the regular opportunity to meet with Epaminondas as well. The young Philip, who showed a keen interest in all things military, must have been completely enamored, hungry to learn more from this esteemed Theban hero which Paminas encouraged and graciously arranged to happen. Not under an exclusive tutorship arrangement, but likely more so in a general sense, with sporadic access to Epaminondas himself alongside the other capable Theban military leaders, thereby providing Philip with perhaps the finest military education that anyone could have hoped for, conducted by the finest caliber military minds of the day. Although Philip would have learned about military strategy and tactics during his upbringing back in Mastodon, he was now getting an education on an entirely different level. He learned military strategy, tactics, and formations from these brilliant Theban masters of war, an eager student voraciously soaking up the lessons rendered, that he, in time, would adapt and improve upon. Now, had the Thebans included any psychics among them, with the ability to foresee future events and what the young Macedonian prince would have done with this knowledge, 
they would have most certainly put an end to it right then and there. Though, as mentioned in the last episode, nobody in their right mind would have ever expected Macedonia to emerge as anything more than a periphery player in that theatre. Among the many valuable lessons that Philip would gain during his time in Thebes, perhaps the most vital and severely lacking in the Macedonian army was the necessity for a capable infantry class, called hoplites in the ancient Greek world. Hoplites formed the core of essentially all Greek armies at this time, a term derived from the shields that they used in battle called the hoplon, a robust, bronze-faced circular shield over top a thick hardwood interior measuring roughly one meter in diameter, offering excellent protection. This infantry class, for those who could afford to take part in it, were also heavily armored, featuring a bronze helmet, a bronze or heavy fabric chestplate or cuirass, and lastly, greaves to help protect the lower legs. The Hoplite's main weapon was an iron-tipped spear, 2-3 to three meters in length, called the Dory. However, they also carried a short sword as a secondary weapon, in case the spear broke or the infantry formation was broken. Hoplites were most effective and primarily designed for fighting as part of a bigger unit, called a phalanx. A rectangular mass of troops, shields interlocked, spears protruding, with the goal of pushing, stabbing, and breaking the formation of whatever stood in front of them, typically an opposing phalanx, and had time and time again been proven to be exceedingly effective in battle. For example, when playing a central role in defeating the Achaemenid Persian invasion, pushing them out of Greece and all the way back to Asia in 479 BCE. The Theban hoplites were excellent soldiers. While essentially similar to the spear and shield-wielding soldiers common to all Greek city-states, they were praised for their skill and competency, not granted through any gifts imbued from the gods, but from a superior training regimen. In most Greek city-states, the hoplites consisted of free citizens, from landowning families and the aristocracy, those who could afford the costly equipment to join. In fact, arms and armor were often passed down as family heirlooms for successive generations to take part in the military, as duty and prestige was attached to service. Beyond the exclusivity of participation due to cost, there were other limitations with this model, being that most armies were in effect citizen militia, with one notable exception to this norm being Sparta, whose citizens were professional soldiers, but at this point in time, struggling with military manpower constraints. For the citizens of most Greek city-states, however, soldiering was not a full-time or year-round vocation, even for the bulk of the Theban army, receiving not much more than basic military training, serving in the army or in military campaigns sporadically as the need arose with the campaigning season normally being between late spring to late summer or early fall. The typical cadence for a citizen soldier was something like planting crops in the spring, going off to war if needed, and then back home for the harvest. Thebes, however, had a solve for this, a small but finely tuned contingent that could and had been proven to be the difference maker in the field of battle, the sacred band of Thebes taking us to the story we covered at the top end of this episode. Philip, during his time in captivity, was afforded the opportunity to view this elite force of the Theban army that had played a headlining role in ending Spartan domination. 300 hand-picked men all selected for this illustrious unit based solely on merit and ability, regardless of their social class, fully funded by the state, relentlessly trained year-round and in a constant state of battle readiness. The prevailing notion is that these 300 warriors were in fact 150 pairs of male lovers, bound by love to stand, fight, and protect their partners until victorious or until the bitter end. Although this is debated, and it may simply be that these troops took solemn vows to protect each other and the state. One thing is for certain, the sacred band were an elite force far beyond the form and function of regular hoplites, disciplined beyond reproach and ready to give up their lives if need be. And in the hands of a brilliant general like Epaminondas, 
devastatingly effective. The tactically minded Epaminondas is credited with inventing the slanting phalanx formation, wherein the Theban army would advance to the enemy in a staggered line. The sacred band placed strategically as shock troops, used for a distinctive purpose, as the first point of contact with the enemy's forces in battle, and typically leveled at their best troops and leaders, confident in their ability to defeat any opposition in a toe-to-toe fight, such as against the Spartans at the Battle of Lyctra. Now, the impact on enemy morale had to have been significant. As soon as an opposing army saw its best soldiers defeated or put to flight, the rest must have been completely dismayed, losing heart to continue on. The sacred band were so finely tuned and disciplined that despite their small number, had already been shown to be the deciding factor in battles involving thousands more. For Philip, as an astute student of war, I am convinced that these experiences must have had a deeply profound impact on him. Understanding that, like all other militaries of the nations in that part of the world, Macedon, of course, had always had an infantry, but it was mediocre at best. Its importance neglected in favor of the prestigious Macedonian companion cavalry that we touched on in episode 12. While Philip was in Thebes, his mind exploding with military epiphanies that could be leveraged by his struggling nation, the situation in the kingdom of Macedon worsened, with toxic infighting and court intrigues that threatened and almost succeeded in permanently removing the Argea dynasty from their seat of power. Thanks to Ptolemy that we were introduced to in episode 12, the lover of Philip's mother Eurydice, who had co-led a failed coup to remove Amyntas III, Philip's father, as king towards the late 370s BCE. Another opportunity to make an attempt was now at hand, following King Alexander II's ill-planned and disastrous attempt to conquer northern Thessaly in 368 BCE, which of course resulted in Philip being handed over as a hostage to Thebes. Although Eurydice, the mother of the reigning Macedonian monarch, had died around this time, Ptolemy was still quite active in drumming up support among the Macedonian nobility for his ascendancy greatly helped by the fact that internal confidence and support for Alexander II had evaporated. Ptolemy's campaigning for leadership was then also given a huge outside boost from the Theban oligarchs, who were getting into the swing of exercising their believed hegemonic right to meddle in the affairs of all nearby nations. Favoring Ptolemy as a puppet in place of Alexander II, believing that he could be better trusted to adhere to the Theban interests and those of its allies. As such, in 367 BCE, during a war dance performance attended by Alexander, the armed performers in the midst of their mock battle then put their blades to use in earnest, brutally driving them into the king, this successful assassination having been fully orchestrated by Ptolemy who then asserted himself as the regent ruler of Macedon, being that Perdiccas III, Philip's second eldest brother, and next in line for the throne, was too young, probably around 16, two years away from being of an age to rule. Granted, this power play wasn't universally accepted, especially among the nobility that were still Argeid loyalists, who had called upon Thebes to intervene and prevent this event from devolving into a civil war. However, this was another move that must have been orchestrated as well, because the celebrated Theban general Pelopidas entered Macedon at the head of a strong force and smoothed the transition to uphold Ptolemy's grasp on power. Power that he exerted in full, acting unilaterally as an overbearing regent, not involving Perdiccas in kingdom affairs, trying to keep him in the dark while working in the background to usurp the crown of Macedon for himself. Fortunately, this didn't come to fruition. Believing that Ptolemy was secure in Macedon, the Theban military presence in Macedonia eventually departed, being needed elsewhere to exert their growing power and influence. Being that Sparta, and in particular the Athenians, remained hungry to regain dominance in Greece. And in 365 BCE, Two years after taking power in Macedon, Ptolemy in turn was assassinated 
by the hand or on the order of King Perdiccas III, who had reached the age of majority and had obtained the backing of the bulk of the Macedonian nobility. This, of course, alarmed the Thebans, but Perdiccas put their concerns to rest by renewing the Macedonian alliance with Thebes that Ptolemy had established, by offering favorable trade terms, especially for the prized Macedonian timber, given that Epaminondas was now intent on developing a navy for Thebes to better combat Athens. With Perdiccas also promising to help oppose Athenian expansion, which was showing an aggressive revival, in particular aimed at the independent city of Amphipolis that bordered Macedon to the east, the modern reference point being in northern Greece, close to the mouth of the Struma or Strimonas river, where it meets with the Aegean Sea. Accordingly, Perdiccas sent a sizable garrison of Macedonian troops to Amphipolis to help bolster its defenses, demonstrating a tangible commitment to keeping the city out of Athenian hands. Thebes, in return, responded with an act of goodwill themselves, announcing that they would be freeing Philip from captivity and sending him back to Macedon. From Perdiccas's perspective, while the return of his younger brother was good, it was largely of minor consequence, the far greater prize being winning the acquiescence of Thebes. However, this arrangement came with a considerable negative attached to it putting Macedon directly in open conflict with Athens, who desperately sought to control the city of Amphipolis. Which may be raising the question, what exactly made the city of Amphipolis such a high-priority target for Athens? In short, as we briefly touched upon in episode 12, it was the adjoining, richly endowed gold and silver mines, being that whoever held the city held strategic access to the mines, not to mention that the city was originally founded as an Athenian colony in 437 BCE, though subsequently conquered by the Spartans in 424 during the Peloponnesian War. And later, following the wilting of Spartan dominance, the city then fell through their hands as well, with the inhabitants claiming it as an independent city-state, not under the domination of any foreign power. However, what remained was an intense Athenian desire to retake this former colony of theirs that went rogue, which of course Thebes wanted to prevent. Otherwise, this would have greatly deepened Athenian coffers, riches that would have certainly been put to use to finance the rebuilding of their naval power and overall strength. In late 365 BCE, the now 17-year-old Philip made his way back to Macedonia, returning to the court of his brother, King Perdiccas III, in the capital city of Pella. Arriving as a young man, entering early adulthood, Philip didn't yet possess the commanding presence of his later years. He wasn't yet the heavily bearded, visibly weathered and scarred king that he's typically portrayed as, though the beginnings of a wispy beard, the type that 17-year-olds can grow, was probably starting to appear. Upon returning to his homeland, Although some of the players had changed, the situation in Macedon was rather similar to what he had left behind during his three-year absence. Macedonia remained a pawn of greater foreign powers, some of which who were backing pretenders to the Macedonian throne, notably the Thracians supporting Posianus, and another that Athens was supporting by the name of Argeus. And as usual, the surrounding tribal nations of Dardania, Illyria, Thrace and Paeonia were rattling their swords, brazenly threatening to take more lands unless financial tributes were sent their way. Perdiccas, through previous correspondence and now in discussions with his brother, would have been well aware of the education that Philip had received. With the kingdom facing hostilities from almost every side, Perdiccas wasted little time, throwing Philip right into the mix, sending him out to take charge of the eastern provinces of Macedon a position befitting of his station, but where he would also be facing the very real threats from the Thracians to the east and the Paeonians to the north, with Perdiccas continuing to directly oversee the more populous and wealthy central and western portions of the kingdom. Part of the motivation surrounding this must have been a cautious strategic calculation, intended to keep Philip out of the politics and intrigue in Pella, 
in case he was toying with the idea of making a play for the throne himself. Although Philip was governing the economically weakest and most sparsely populated portion of the kingdom, part of his charge included acting as the general over a body of troops to defend Macedonia's borders, although we unfortunately have no details on the size of this force. While Philip did reportedly an admirable job overall in terms of his five-year governance of Eastern Macedon, it was in military command that he shined, taking this on with an aggressive zeal, possessing the ability and wisdom of someone far older than his age would typically dictate, no doubt heavily influenced by the time he had spent in Thebes. He focused on the fundamentals, training and drilling with his troops relentlessly, demanding a high degree of discipline unlike anything Macedonian soldiers had been faced with previously, but that from there on in would become the norm for any armies under his command, enhancing their physical fitness and mobility with much greater emphasis placed on the infantry, playing a more central role in his configuration. The ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus in his first century BCE work called the Bibliotheca Historica wrote that once Philip improved the organization of his forces and equipped the men suitably with weapons of war, he held constant maneuvers of the men under arms and competitive drills. With other historical accounts stating that Philip made his soldiers march as far as 60 kilometers a day, with personal effects strictly forbidden so as to not be weighed down unnecessarily and inhibit their speed. But it wasn't just his military education. It appears that this role came quite naturally to Philip, and that he in fact seemed to revel in it. Beyond the immense respect that he was beginning to build as a commander, he was evidently the type of leader that was also extremely comfortable in fraternizing with the common soldiers. He wrestled and boxed in the common arena, drank with the troops while tossing out good-natured insults with the best of them, little by little putting together a fine fighting force that was devoted to his leadership which would have been put on display whenever various Thracian tribes from the east and Paeonian tribes from the north sporadically attempted to encroach on Macedonian lands to raid and despoil. Although this notion in particular lacks firm contextual evidence, these types of small-scale incursions were a relatively common occurrence, and I tend to support the idea that Philip and his increasingly mobile troops were now better able to respond, mauling the invaders and forcing hasty retreats much to their surprise, given that they had grown accustomed to facing light opposition. Another theory that I think is quite probable is that during his five-year tenure in eastern Macedon, particularly in the latter portion of his time there, Philip would have started experimenting with the equipment and formation innovations that would later come to define his core infantry, the Macedonian phalanx, making it the scourge of enemy opposition for decades and centuries to come which we'll later dive into the configuration of. However, these ingenious innovations were not likely fully fleshed out yet, or implemented in any meaningful capacity, and were about to be rudely interrupted, sparked by a disaster that landed across the kingdom in the west. Overall, it appears that Philip was doing a solid job governing his regions from 364 to 359. The east was stable with secure borders, the Thracians and Paeonians finding it much more difficult and costly to enter Macedon than in previous years. This in stark contrast to what was happening in central and western Macedonia under King Perdiccas III. As mentioned earlier, maintaining the alliance with Thebes was a necessary component for Perdiccas to keep hold of the crown, but this of course put Macedon into an inevitable collision course with the reinvigorated Athenians, a war that was taking a heavy toll on Macedonia. In 363 BCE, Athens launched an invasion into Macedon, their naval forces as usual extending the reach of their troops, surprising Perdiccas by conquering the important coastal cities of Methoni and Pydna in quick succession. A scary proposition, being that Methoni is only about 40 kilometers to the south of the capital city Pella. Athens then used these newly acquired cities as bases to cause further havoc in the area. For example, Athens used these cities as staging points to make attempts on conquering Amphipolis, at least two assault attempts that were successfully repelled, 
with an underlying note there is that Philip may have had a hand in these encounters since he was stationed in the east. To make matters even worse, Athens was backing a pretender to the Macedonian throne called Argeus, setting him up in Methone with an Athenian hoplite guard to keep him safe enabling him to begin canvassing the surrounding territories in his bid to replace Perdiccas. Unable or unwilling to take on the Athenian forces alone, Perdiccas would have sent urgent requests to Thebes for their assistance, in order to retake their cities, but this was met with an emphatic no, being that Thebes was dealing with a much more significant setback. In fact, the death blow to the maintenance of their Greek supremacy. With the death of Epaminondas, and the defeat of Thebes at the Battle of Mantinea in 362 BCE, with Athens and Sparta working together to cast down the short-lived Theban hegemony, which lasted less than a decade. Leaving that seat essentially vacant, although the Athenians were making a good case to regain it. To say that things were not looking good for the Macedonians would be a gross understatement, and it was about to get worse for Macedon, much worse. With the almost eternal Macedonian foe now nearing his 90th year on earth, the powerful King Bardilus of the Dardanians and southern Illyrian tribes, reappearing in Upper Macedonia in 360 BCE, hungry to take more lands and extract more tribute from Macedon. Bardilus, as you may recall from the last episode, had fought and defeated Philip's father, Amyntas III in 392, sacking Pella and later returned to defeat Philip's eldest brother, Alexander II, in 370, wherein he began occupying a large portion of Upper Macedonia, which was still in his hands. Understanding that Perdiccas was struggling anew under the weight of the Athenian invasion, Bardilus seized upon this opportunity to carve out more of Upper Macedonia for himself, entering at the head of a large force. Laughing in the face of the life expectancy in classical Greece, which was 25 to 28 years of age, his advanced age doing nothing to temper or slow down his ambition and drive. Perdiccas did apparently have some smaller forces in field and commanded them to oppose Bardilus's approach, but they were easily swept aside or quickly gave themselves up, believing that this collection of Dardanian and Illyrian warriors could not be defeated. Infuriated by the mounting losses and poor showings, with the Macedonian forces regularly melting away against the invaders, King Perdiccas gathered an army, probably in the realm of around 10,000 troops, and took it upon himself to lead them into Upper Macedonia to retake these lands in late 360 BCE. Determined to face Bardilus head-on, though the quality of the Dardanian and Illyrian infantry that were essentially hoplites as well would have been far greater, better trained, and the veterans of numerous military campaigns. Unfortunately, we have no details on the battle itself. However, we do know that it ended up as a massive catastrophe for the kingdom of Macedon. According to Diodorus Siculus, the Macedonians had lost more than 4,000 men in battle, and the remainder, panic-stricken, had become exceedingly afraid of the Illyrian armies and had lost heart for continuing the war. Bardilus and his army had thoroughly routed the Macedonian contingent. 4,000 Macedonian soldiers left strewn about, dead on the battlefield, accounting for more than a third of the royal army, with King Perdiccas III included among the casualties. The kingdom of Macedon was on the very edge of collapse, its military capabilities severely weakened, the morale of its remaining troops devastated, unable and unwilling to fight on a Dardanian Illyrian army on the loose plundering without restraint within its domains, lands being lost to both them and other heavy-hitting foreign powers including Athens, who firmly held possession of some of its key cities. The entire fate of the kingdom now resting in the hands of Perdiccas's son and heir, Amyntas IV, a mere infant. While thinking about this, I couldn't help but liking this to the hunting tactics of a lion pride when taking on prey larger in size than they are, when one is found isolated from the herd, like a 2,000 pound Cape Buffalo, five times the mass of a single lion. The pride will surround and confuse the lone beast, 
distracting it until a powerful lion leaps onto its back, biting down, looking to sever the buffalo's spinal cord, raking it with its claws and holding it in a death grip, with the rest of the pride then joining in to bring down the large animal and commence the feast. Similarly, adding to the bleak prospects threatening the very existence of their kingdom, the Macedonian nobility would have been acutely aware that once news spread of their dire vulnerability, other neighboring nations would be venturing in to forcibly take their share of the spoils. And for what it's worth, they were absolutely correct in that assumption. With Paeonians to the north and Thracians to the east shortly thereafter, both making extensive preparations to join in on the kill. An emergency assembly was immediately called for, with the ranking nobility summoned, including Philip, who gathered in Pella in early 359 BCE, to not only discuss how they were going to dig themselves out of this mess, but also who was going to lead this unenviable task, given that Amentus IV was clearly too young to do so. Shouts would have began ringing out during the proceedings, attendees naming various esteemed candidates to be considered for the role, with a notable jump of audible support voiced when Philip's name was put forward. While probably only known to the assembly members hailing from central and western Macedonia by reputation only, although they may have met him during his youth before being shipped off to Thebes, it would have been widely recognized that Philip, now 23 years old, had done an admirable job in stabilizing Eastern Mastodon over the past five years, in particular commanding the deep respect of those under his command. As such, in 359 BCE, Philip II was acclaimed as regent and protector to King Amentus IV and the Kingdom of Macedon. Now, as a side note, there is some debate on exactly what this meant as some historians assert that he wasn't selected as regent but as king in place of his infant nephew, with others that argue that he was first chosen as regent but then raised officially to the title of king in the year that followed, or perhaps as late as 357, after pulling off some pretty miraculous maneuvers to salvage the realm. Regardless of how it transpired, what we do know with confidence is that even if lacking the official title, for all intents and purposes, he was now the absolute authority in Macedon, a role that would never be relinquished until his death. Philip must have been aware that this was a strong possibility, as he was prepared to offer up a resounding speech to the assembly. Young and charismatic, he was reportedly an exceptional orator, speaking with resolute confidence asserting that he would guide the kingdom out of despair helping to mend the wounded pride and broken morale of his people, even if only incrementally at this point, it was still something moving them in the right direction. Full of vigor and determined to dig Macedon out of the hole that they had found themselves in, Philip immediately marched out to the royal palace, found a comfortable chair, and sat himself behind a desk, beginning a furious letter-writing campaign to his enemies. Not what you expected? Well, unlike others who, had they been in his position, might have promptly marched out to scrape together an army before hitting back out at their enemies, which probably would have been the final nail in the coffin for Macedon at that point, considering the poor morale and state of what was left of its military, Philip wisely understood the idea that the pen can indeed be mightier than the sword at times, but certainly true in the hands of someone like him, who could wield it like a master flexing some diplomatic muscle, understanding the wants and needs of the intended recipient, and working it into his master plan, in this case, to eke out Mastodon's survival. Slightly paraphrased, the ancient Roman historian Justin wrote the following of Philip in his second century work called the Philippic Histories. At the commencement of his reign, he was handed a poverty-stricken kingdom, exhausted by a series of wars, surrounded by a multitude of enemies, which, as if by common conspiracy to crush Macedonia, rose around him from different nations and several quarters at the same time, to all of which he could not at once make resistance. He wisely put an end to some by offers of peace and bought others off. If his kingdom was to survive this terrible storm, time was the key. He needed to buy time so he could figure out how to defend themselves and begin addressing the innumerable challenges surrounding Macedonia. Piece by piece, 
clawing their way out of this wreckage. The flurry of activity of scribes, pages, and couriers coming and going from Philip wherever he went must have been something to behold, though he was by no means chained to his desk, as much of his time would have been spent out in the field revitalizing the Macedonian army, refilling the lost ranks, and then, as he did when stationed in the east, subjecting all to a thoroughly rigorous training regimen, demanding nothing less than the utmost discipline while working towards what would become the cornerstone of his reformed military, an infantry that was going to play the core role in his new Macedonian army, armed with innovative weapons, equipment, and tactics that would prove to be a game changer of epic proportions. Called the Macedonian Phalanx, which from afar to the inexperienced eye might have appeared quite similar to the traditional hoplite-based phalanx that was prevalent throughout Greece. However, key differences would have soon become apparent upon approaching closer to this intimidating mass of troops in field. Though as a quick side note, not all of the following changes were implemented at once, as this was more so of an evolution rather than a sudden changeover. For example, the equipment would drastically change, with soldiers using the sarissa as their main weapon, effectively a spear more than double in length to what the hoplites used. A sarissa was around 6 to 7 meters in length, giving the Macedonian phalanx a huge reach advantage and an intimidating wall of spears pointing out, the first five rows of soldiers able to reach out and jab at the opposing forces. The sarissa featured an iron-tipped spearhead and a bronze butt spike to help balance this cumbersome weapon, but also to allow them to anchor it into the ground in the face of an enemy cavalry charge. Extremely useful, but again cumbersome and heavy, so much that it needed to be held in two hands. Accordingly, the large hoplon shield was dropped in favor of a much smaller shield that may have been either strapped to their left arm or hung from their necks ready for use when needed, say for example when missile weapons were thrown their way. To help offset the weight of their heavier main weapon, Philip then also lightened the weight of their bronze helmets and changed the body armor from metal to a lighter fabric, with the short sword retained as a secondary weapon. Overall, with all these changes, individual equipment weighed as much as 10 pounds less than the typical hoplite, which may not sound like much, but in the oppressive heat of summer, over long marches in difficult terrain, anything that helped to conserve energy and strength for battle would undoubtedly add to the game-changing nature of these innovations while also enhancing the army's mobility, which, as mentioned earlier, Philip placed great importance on, allowing no slow-moving logistical support carts drawn by oxen within the column. In order to keep his army nimble and ready to march off to take advantage of enemy movements when favorable or ward off incursions when they arose. But Philip's innovations went much deeper than that because the purpose and function of his infantry would be fundamentally different from the typical hoplite phalanx. Whereas most states utilized hoplites in a jack-of-all-trades type of approach as practically the sole means by which to win battles, Philip saw this as a weakness to be exploited, instead configuring the units within his army to each serve a specialized or distinct role for winning a battle that, in order to be effective, needed to be employed together. That has since been commonly referred to as the hammer and anvil military tactic that Philip is often credited with developing. The role of the Macedonian phalanx was to pin the opposing forces down, applying constant pressure. A wall of spear points that was sometimes sufficient to break whatever lay in front of it. However, its main function was to keep the enemy occupied or act as the anvil, while the Macedonian companion cavalry wheeled around to flank the enemy, crashing into them from the sides or the rear as the hammer, disrupting opposing formations, causing them to fall into disarray. Although the utility and importance of the infantry was no longer being neglected, there still remained a feeling of lesser prestige attached to those that belonged to its ranks, at least in comparison to the companion cavalry, called eteroi in Greek. So, Philip began to remedy this as well, rebranding and elevating the Macedonian infantry as the Pezeteroi, meaning foot companions. 
And these weren't just empty words, because actions followed that essentially put the infantry on par with the cavalry. By introducing the finest of their ranks into Philip's immediate orbit, their voices now counting for something in assemblies, while also joining in with Philip, feasting and drinking with the king of Macedon, which of course had the additional benefit of binding these soldiers to their king, who were increasingly ready to follow and fight for him wherever he led them, while also developing a sense of camaraderie and perhaps some healthy competition between the various military units under his command. However, in the midst of all these changes that were in their infancy at this point, one thing was exceedingly paramount. Training. Unabating, relentless drilling and training. All the units in his army. A fundamental aspect that would continue over time, throughout the entirety of his career in fact, pushing his troops to get stronger, unwavering, molding them into an unstoppable force of nature. But all of this was now contingent on the Macedonian phalanx, as the new backbone of the entire army, as success could only be realized if the soldiers kept their formations and nerve in the heat of battle. With Philip making his intention clear that this was not going to be a seasonal type army, but a year-round vocation, Macedonians paid to become a professional standing army although he was probably scrounging to find the money to keep them paid. But forgive me, because we are getting way ahead of ourselves here, being that this evolution was most certainly in its early stages, and Philip was in desperate need of time to pull this together. So while getting his army into some semblance of fighting readiness, he was also buying time with his enemies. Literally, paying off Macedonia's neighbors to stall their impending aggressions. First, dealing with the Thracians bordering eastern Macedonia, who, lucky for Philip, were then dealing with an internal power struggle, since King Cotus had died in the prior year, leaving his three sons as successors over a divided kingdom that soon fell into dispute, each vying for absolute control, offering up the perfect opportunity for someone like Philip to exploit. Berisades, the son that held the Thracian lands closest to Macedon, still held Posianus in his pocket, who you may remember from the last episode was a pretender to the Macedonian throne that had unsuccessfully led a Thracian-backed invasion into Macedon 10 years prior in 369. Understanding this, Philip was able to fully take advantage of the situation, paying off Berisades, who was eagerly grasping out for funds to continue battling his brothers for control of Thrace with Berisades in turn agreeing to not attack Macedon, but also relinquish supporting Posianus, who was probably executed right then and there, since we never hear of him again. With the Thracian threat thus quieted for now, Philip then turned his attention to the Paeonians, who bordered Macedon to the north. By this point, I've mentioned the Paeonians a number of times, so let's just take a couple of moments to cover who these people were. The territories of the Kingdom of Paeonia, sandwiched between Illyria and Dardania to the west and Thrace to the east, roughly corresponds with the modern northern lands of North Macedonia and western Bulgaria. It consisted primarily of independent tribes that in recent decades leading up to that point in time had become more unified under a dominant tribal chieftain by the name of King Agis, who became Paeonia's centralized ruler though only really loosely bound to this centralized ruler, as the dominant notion is that the Paeonian tribes continue to operate heavily independent from one another, often squabbling amongst themselves as well. As such, Philip scraped the Macedonian coffers for every last ounce of gold and silver he could scrounge, and sent various payments northwards, not just to King Agis, but also to the influential regional tribal chieftains as well thereby decreasing the overall Paeonian appetite for war. Although the Thracians and Paeonians were satisfied for now, Philip understood that before long they would come back clamoring for more. And there was a much greater and more immediate threat to Macedonia's future that had to be dealt with first, so that Philip could gain the needed time to continue getting his military ready for the dangerous road that lay ahead. But gold wasn't going to cut it this time, because King Bardilus of the Dardanians and Illyrians 
already had Macedonian gold coming in, while controlling large portions of Upper Macedonia as well. Philip was going to need to offer up something even more intriguing to hold off the ancient Dardanian king. So Philip offered up himself, proposing a union between the families, and a chance for Bardilus to seal his legacy by introducing his bloodline into that of the Argeids, and ultimately the Macedonian throne, to which Bardilus readily agreed, with Philip marrying Audata, who was either Bardilus's daughter, granddaughter, or great-granddaughter. In celebration of this marriage, an alliance was agreed upon between the two nations, although the terms were heavily slanted in favor of Bardilus, who held every advantage, which Philip recognized and accepted, at least for now, being that this action undoubtedly deterred a full-scale Dardanian invasion of Macedon when his country was most vulnerable, and that bought him the valuable time that he was seeking to continue implementing the military improvements and diligent training regiment that he had kicked off when raised to leadership, as regent and protector to King Amentus IV and the Kingdom of Macedon. Philip's first year in power was shaping up to be a promising one, and somehow, without jumping into any battles whatsoever, he had managed to steer his nation clear from complete disaster, employing intelligent diplomatic measures to keep the surrounding vultures at bay. But one more pressing threat remained active within his kingdom, that being an active war with the powerful Athenians and their support of another pretender to the Macedonian throne, Argeus. Since conquering the coastal cities of Methone and Pydna in 363 BCE, Athenian designs on conquering additional Macedonian cities had somewhat calmed, as Philip understood that they were laser-focused on regaining the city of Amphipolis and its fabulously rich gold mines, which, as you may recall, while being an independent city, still retained a Macedonian garrison to help defend its walls. Philip inferred that, despite the Athenian support of Argeus's claim, however dubious it was, this was purely a political play, not some type of righteous act, intended to install someone who would not oppose Athenian plans for the region. Philip figured out a way to use this to his advantage, given the right opportunity, and he would almost certainly have had eyes on Argeus, waiting for him to make a move stationed in the city of Methone and protected by Athenian troops, who was growing impatient and increasingly frustrated that Athens was not willing to commit any additional resources to help him capture more Macedonian territories. Unwilling to wait any more time, Argeus decided to take this task upon himself, acquiring a force of mercenaries, estimated at 3,000 strong, and marched out westwards from Methone in late 359 BCE, making the 30-kilometer trek to the old Macedonian capital of Aegae. Of note is that, although the Athenians did not commit any meaningful troop numbers to Argeus' army, they did apparently send some observers and advisors to assist Argeus in this endeavor. Upon arriving at the defended gates of Aegae, Argeus announced his claim as the king of Macedon, expecting to be acclaimed as such by the inhabitants, with the gates cast open wide. However, his overtures were met with defiance, and it's not clear why, but perhaps through an unwillingness to recognize the claims of someone who was clearly backed by a foreign power, obviously a puppet in their eyes. Dejected, unable to make any headway there, Argeus led his mercenary army back to Methone to figure out his next steps. However, en route, that was when he was confronted by Philip at the head of his newly retooled army, whose mobility had already been shown to be of huge benefit, completely surprising Argeus and his Athenian advisors. Now, this was quite a gamble on Philip's side, being that the bulk of his troops, however well trained, were still quite inexperienced. Nonetheless, Philip didn't entertain any negotiations with this pretender fully intending to speak through force of arms, leading his army from the front. Sadly, there are few documented details on this encounter, so we have no insights on the troop count that Philip had brought to the table, nor the tactics he used to win his first notable victory. However, 
What is absolutely clear is that Philip and his Macedonian army proceeded to crush Argeas and his mercenaries, eviscerating them to a man, most importantly, leaving Argeas and his claim silent forever. Interestingly, Philip treated the accompanying Athenian observers and advisors graciously, and despite being at war, with unexpected mercy, letting them return to Methoni unharmed. Calculated kindness, which also came with another message that would soon have the Athenians salivating, offering up peace terms, wherein Philip promised to remove the Macedonian garrison from Amphipolis, essentially clearing the path for Athens to retake the city they so eagerly wanted, the prize that Philip knew they had wanted all along, all their subsequent efforts being subject to that main goal. Athens ratified the peace deal, and despite the Macedonian cities of Methone and Pydna staying in their hands, Philip delivered on his promise and recalled the Macedonian garrison to Pella. As 359 BCE came to a close, Philip's first year in power had been a resounding success, a truly impressive testament to his skill as a leader. Two pretenders to the throne eliminated, and the four main foreign threats stalled from ransacking the kingdom of Macedon, thereby preserving its sovereignty and buying him the time that he needed to begin elevating and innovating the Macedonian army. Macedonians, whether commoners or nobility, must have been feeling an electric excitement in the air, as if they were on the verge of something monumental. It was, of course, hard to deny that it was already an astoundingly different environment from what Philip was handed, when everything seemed so dark less than a year ago. But this was just the beginning, and it was now time for Philip to go on the offensive. In the next episode, we'll follow along as Philip, having guided the kingdom of Macedon back from the edge of collapse in his first year of power, now undertakes a much more aggressive posture, exploiting every possible opportunity to begin hitting back at the surrounding nations that in recent decades had been regularly gnawing on Macedonian lands. Leading his revamped and exceptionally trained but inexperienced army for a monumental showdown with King Bardellus of the Dardanians and Illyrians, determined to break his stranglehold on Upper Macedonia. All of this before continuing to interweave military and diplomatic genius to claw back every inch of the ancestral Macedonian domains, turning the heads and raising the alarm of all nations within Greece, who begin cobbling together alliances and taking actions to keep this audacious upstart held at the fringes of their world. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show. It would be greatly appreciated if you could rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure, and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions on future warlords that you think I should do an episode on. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from audionautics.com 